everyone. Thanks for tuning in to A Couple with Janine and Jenny. And I have with me the lovely Janine Castle, who, as you all know, does a wonderful astrology amongst many other things. How are you going, Janine? Hello, Jennifer, my friend and psychic medium. I'm very good this Friday afternoon. We're getting cosy today. Oh, okay. Well, I'm in Victoria. And all I can say is thank God it's Friday today. And I have my cup of tea and um, apparently we're going to talk about the different eras that different planets bring in. And today mm. it's going to be Neptune, is that right? Today's Neptune. I think Neptune, discovery of Neptune is, is not really talked about much in astrology, but I know that the beginning of Neptune heralds an era that you're really very familiar with as a psychic medium. That's right. And this is why I've got this background because it's spooky today. Mm. And my, it may give my people background an indication <laughs> of what's coming. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, you and I both love history, don't we? Mm. We can yabber on about history and politics forever. Yep. So um, I'm going to give you just a little bit of a background of what, what was going on around the time that Neptune was discovered and what it meant for our culture, society, and for the world. Excellent. Go so I'll start. Good. So Neptune was discovered in 1846, so right in the middle of the 1800s. There was a lot going on around that time. Now, bear in mind, Uranus was discovered in 1781. So, you know, in, in the previous, um, what have we got? Uh, 60 years, 60 years prior to Neptune being discovered, Uranus was discovered. And Uranus is all about new technology. It's all about industrialization. It's all about um, revolutions, right? So we've got the French Revolution, the Industrial Revolution. And so the next stage was Neptune being discovered. And when a planet is discovered, it's an awakening for a culture. Now, our three big outer planets have been discovered in the last 300 years, which is why the last 300 years have been so huge in history and our growth has been exponential. As soon as we discover a new planet, and I mean a significant one, not a little one, a big one. one that has impact, yeah. Yeah, they, I know we discover them all the time, but when we discovered it with our minimal technology, our awareness and our consciousness exploded. So in the mid 1800s, Neptune was discovered and interestingly enough, they predicted Neptune to be discovered before it was actually discovered. So what led to its discovery was this prediction. Somebody thought in 1846 in September that Neptune must exist, it had to exist. So they went out and found it and they found it not long after. It was a very interesting prediction. Now Neptune, we now know, we didn't know at the time, but we now know in retrospect, Neptune brings an emotional quality to our collective. Uranus brought an intellectual one. Uranus brought the age of enlightenment in, which was the explosion of the intellect, science, everything became science and reason. And with Neptune, everything became emotional. Everything became faith-based. Everything became, we became interested in beauty and, and all of these Neptunian things. So um, a lot of spiritual stuff happened when Neptune came into our, our lives, and I would call it a spiritual awakening. It's not the sort of spiritual awakening we think is cool these days because our tastes have changed. But I think you'd have to agree that um, so much of our spiritual belief has not just come from Christianity 2,000 years ago and Buddha. It actually started to emerge around this time. A lot of our modern spiritual and religious beliefs. So Neptune, I'm going to go through the categories. Neptune okay. is all about, it's all about love and romance. Now, if you study history, you know that there wasn't a lot of love and romance around. 
Okay, so everyone had arranged marriages. Yep. They were marriages of convenience. Well, Nobody expressed their feelings. Yeah. Sorry. That's right. All for money. Neptune gave us love and romance. Yep. Now, if you look at literature around that time, we had a lot of new styles of literature. First of all, we had women writing about romance. Yes. So we had a whole range of different authors came out talking about romance. And it wasn't just in our English culture. It was all around Europe. So we had the Bronte sisters. I'm going to read them all out. Lewis Carroll, Emerson, Emily Dickinson, Charles Dickens, Thomas Hardy, Mark Twain, H.G. Wells. And then we had the Russian romance movement with Dostoevsky and Tolstoy. Happened to be my favourite. Yeah. So they were all romances. They were all, you know, Pride and Prejudice. It was all about, you know, the beginning of love in matrimony. Yes. And that's the Neptune idealism. Right. And Neptune's about going into a higher ideal of love, not just a very basic, mundane, practical love. We're talking about the, you know, love and perfection, the perfect love. So, of course, Jane Eyre was written in 1847 and Neptune was discovered in um, 18, what did I say? 46. 1846. Hmm. So, how about that? A year later, Jane Eyre was written. Wow. One of the classic romantic yes. novels. Yeah. So, we had poetry and I was reading that at this time, 1950, sorry, 1850, I think, it was the first time the concept of girlfriend and boyfriend was introduced in literature. It wasn't a, a word. No. Oh, really? So, yeah, and then you get boyfriend, girlfriend is, is a um, definition of romance, really. So you had this introduction of emotion into literature and culture and art. Of course, in art, you had the romantic era which turned into Impressionism with Monet. And, of oh. course, Impressionism is the feeling of the image. Yes. It wasn't the exact image. It was the impression of the image. So yeah. you were allowed to interpret it in your own way, and that was huge in art. Yes. That was the first time True. in art you were allowed to extrapolate and put your own feeling into it. Before that, it had to be exactly so. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so, that's true. Hmm. So we had this introduction of feelings and everybody wanted to, well, we start, our feelings started to leak out. Yeah. And we were trying to make sense of, you know, uh, trying to make sense of this over, these overwhelming urges to seek a higher love. It, it infiltrated, like I said, in poetry, philosophy, even fashion. Fashion went back to the neo-imperialist fashion, which it was a fantasy. It was a fantasy of going back into the, um, you know, the, that Napoleonic time, going back into Ro the Roman era. So we did a lot of fantasizing at this time, which is also a Neptunian thing. And then we get the breakthroughs in medicine and science. Yeah. So Neptune rules certain types of medicine, not herbal medicine, but it rules poisons, so, painkillers. So penicillin, things like that. Medicare. Not penicillin, no, that's an antibiotic. But interesting you say that because Pluto was discovered in 1930 just before antibiotics and Pluto oh, is okay. a great A different era, okay. Different era, but uh, Neptune rules anaesthetics. Okay. So this was the time in the mid-1800s where we, we were using a lot of poisons. So we were using a lot of mercury, um, antimony. We were using a lot of sulfur. And if it didn't kill you, you survived. So we were poisoning ourselves. Yeah. We, we started um, using painkillers. So the anaesthetics started coming in. So we started to be able to do operations because we couldn't feel anything, which, you know, Neptune's all about zoning out. Mm. right it's all about just going into another dimension and that's what you do when you're on an anesthetic we had homeopathy was discovered mm. and homeopathy is essentially the memory of water and neptune rules water i yep. mean 
homeopathy is huge when you get out of Australia. So that was big. We discovered oxygen, Neptune rules gas, in that we could isolate oxygen and use it in operations. And we had radiation. That's another Neptune thing. Um, we had the opium wars at that time. So because we discovered that opium was such a good painkiller and medicine was exploding, we wanted a lot of it. So we were scouring through Asia, trying to get the monopoly on this new painkiller opium. And of course, then we, then we had the start of drug addiction as well. Yeah, so say, course, they had the opium dens and all that. Even in Adelaide, I think um, they had opium dens as well. Oh, yeah. and I think, wasn't um, H.G. Wells and Lewis Carroll, what, didn't they write their books? Yes. On um, hallucinogenic. Yes. So there was a lot of fantasizing, drug taking going on, tripping out was going on. We think it was the 1960s, but no, they were doing it in the mid 1800s. Yeah. And then politically, yep. what was going on? We'd had a slavery boom, and the mid 1800s was the beginning of the end of slavery. So we started to bring forth. Uh, a more pure political approach to slavery. And I think it was about 1845, 1850, they started to try to do, um, what was it called when they stopped slavery? The the abol uh, abolishing. Ab slavery. Abolition, yeah. They started to work towards abolition. And of course, um, Neptune can rule victimization and emancipation. Okay. So that's exactly what was going on. We were identifying victimization and we were looking to liberate uh, the victims. And then we got, we had some other technological things. We had the steam engine was invented at this time. Of course, steam is ruled by Neptune. So then when we got the steam engine, we had all of those trains going all over the world. We had ships going really fast across the sea. So we had this explosion of trade and business yeah. and commerce. We had these wars to do with the oceans, like the Panama Canal and the Crimean War. And then also it's a political issue, alcohol, right? So Neptune rules addiction and alcohol. So what was going on at this time? We know Prohibition was, I think, 1930, but this was the beginning of Prohibition. So what happened in the beginning is that the women got together and said, our men are drinking too much and it has to stop. So the first um, law for Prohibition came out in 1850, I think thereabouts. So that was the beginning of saying, we have a big addictive problem in this country and we have to address it. So then we had the world of entertainment and in the world of entertainment, we got photography. Photography was a slow burn, but by the 1850s, we were photographed crazy. And then that turned into film. So Neptune rules photography and film because Neptune rules image, okay? The image, either the painting, the photograph or the film. Now, Neptune in our modern sense is social media as well and Instagram. But in, the, in those days, it was those beautiful Impressionist paintings and those early photographs. Yeah. And most importantly, we had a spiritual boom. Now, you and I were around in the 1990s when there was a new age boom. That was nothing compared to what was going on mm. in the 1800s. That was tiny. <laughs> Yeah, tiny <laughs> in comparison. So Neptune rules faith, your relationship with God. It rules your spiritual life. It rules religion and magic. It rules mystery. It rules visits, visitations, experiences of angels, anything that's out of this world, experiences that are not of this earth and out of this world. Uh, it also rules deception, illusion and things like that. And there was a lot of that sort of stuff going on as well. For every mystical experience, there was a sceptic trying to prove it was an illusion, you know, wasn't there? You'll be able to tell us all about that. Yep. Um, the, I think the year after Neptune was discovered, Darwin um, wrote his theory of evolution. 
Okay. Which, which you think is a scientific theory, and it was, but I tell you what, what, what that did was challenge the church. Right? Oh, so yeah. we had our Christian churches for 2,000 years nearly. So Darwin said, mm, don't think that's right. So everything was up for grabs there. So religion had to reinvent itself, mm. challenge itself, and really offer the people something different. So we had a, a religious revivalism that was not the old, antiquated, stiff, sort of uh, monastic medieval version. Yeah. It, was, um, it was called the Third Great Awakening in the 1850s of the Protestant religion. So Protestantism split off into a thousand pieces and we had all these Reformation movements. And that was part of a bigger romanticism movement that was going on. You were converted because of your own, own spiritual experience. You yeah. had a choice. Yeah. So people were really yearning to shed that medieval experience of, of spirituality. And they were going for something much higher, much more idealistic. And they all wanted an experience of God. And of course, because the Bible had been translated by now, they all felt that they had a right to something greater than what was being, what was on offer before. So that's where we should talk about um, mysticism and spiritualism, which I know you know a lot about. So, well, that is so interesting. And what I'm going to tell you, Janine, is going to blow your mind because that all fits in perfectly on all levels that you're talking about mm. religion mysticism science emancipation of women um all sorts of things it's just amazing so i'm going to talk about the beginnings of spiritualism uh which happened in the usa not in england and that happened in 1848 wow what exactly happened on so, that um, everyone probably knows the story in my field, but it was the Fox sisters who sat and began to do rapping on the walls of spirit. Right? Really? Is that and 1848? So 1848. Wow. And so what happened is that uh, Morse code had been invented around that time too. Mm. So they decided that spirit rapping was sort of like a Morse code. Oh. Right, and so they'd ask a question and then they'd go through the alphabet. So they'd give, you know, say someone's name was Catherine, they'd go one, two, three, stop, cat C, right? So it's very long winded, but anyway, it was revolutionary. Mm. And they, they were um, not wealthy children, young girl, young teenagers, and they um, eventually started a movement which I'm sure everyone knows about a fair bit. It's and they travelled to Australia, uh, travelled the United States. It was uh, two rapping. years after Neptune was discovered. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yep. And uh, spiritual, spiritualism through them started to grow. So everybody got interested in, through that, um, contacting the other world, right? Mm -hmm. So spiritualism grew. And you'd be interested to know that this was the first religion that was established that looked at women as equals. Really? Men. And that's amazing when I think about that. And it, saw, and it was the only religion that allowed women to speak in public at that time. It was the only area that women could speak in public at that time. Not wow. only religion, but the only avenue other though otherwise women were silenced incredible mm. and um the other thing is um then then um america moved so that just grew and grew through america and um the civil war started right and during the civil war uh, because there were a lot of deaths of the men spiritual and exploded because it was the first time for many many a while that the people couldn't um, say goodbye to their dead 
Mm. Right. So normally they used to have it at home, right, and and live with their dead uh, loved ones in their house in the coffin, and they'd have time to say goodbye before the ceremony and the burial. But this was the first time they couldn't do that. So men were dying on the field, and you know there was an uproar about it, and and it and spiritually and naturally exploded because mm. you could go to a medium and talk to your dead son or husband or whatever, and. At that time, there were 11 million spiritualists in the United States. No way! Yep. And get this, 35,000 psychic mediums. Oh! Oh, my Lord! Yeah. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? That is an explosion. It, you asked me um, when we posed this topic, you said what was going on in America at that time. And I was looking at it this morning and, and America's got Neptune in the house of religion. Oh, so they're naturally very religious, faith-based people. Yeah. And at that time in 1846, Jupiter was on their Neptune. And, and I always interpret that if it's a human as a spiritual awakening. Okay. Well, they, they, they had it then. Big, 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 big. And the interesting thing about it was that, um, and also during the Civil War, um, I think it was, um, I've got it written down here somewhere, Nettie, Nettie Maynard uh, in 1890, uh, in the 1880s um, or 1891, uh, released a book on her journey as a trance medium for no. Abe Lincoln. No. So she did years, um, in the White House as a trance medium. And it was Spirit, for those who don't know, it was Spirit who talked to Abe Lincoln to persuade him to relieve, release the slavery. Is that in the movie? I think there's no, a movie in the movie. No, they cut all that out. Um, no, we can't have that in a movie. No, no, no. So anyway, the, um, it's it's been verified, right? So Mary... Uh, his wife was a great spiritualist. So they would have parlours, sittings in the White House where um, um, she, the medium would, um, Nettie would um, bring some energies in and go into trance, just sitting there. And they even had the piano, the grand piano with Abe Lincoln sitting on it and someone else sitting on it, trying to keep it on the ground. So she had physical mediumship as well. And it's it's well well written up. I think they found out about it because um, I think that the records were in the library somewhere, right? So um, he consulted spirit about the freedom, and he got a lot of pressure not to free the slaves. Yes, he did. And um, but he did it on their advice. So that's interesting as a sideline. So she released her book about 1890 about her um, ex experiences in the White House. So that was interesting. Um, in 1875, uh, the other thing about spiritualism was it was a, um, a projector or a uh, inspiration uh, because it gave women a voice to the suffragette movement. Yes. And yes. To the freedom, the freedom of, of women to have a vote, but also just freedom to wear what they wanted to do, wear to to have which fits in with your love romantic love to have relationships how they saw you know saw fit for themselves and this was revolutionary as, as well and there was a woman called victoria woodhall and she was the first woman ever in america who ran for president at that time oh. mm. and she was a spirit spiritualist and she was also um involved in the women's rights movement of course the populace thought she was of the devil right because she a woman doing that is just not on so that's an interesting background to spiritualism i didn't even know about um yeah. that i know the um abolition movement started with with women and mm. those women went on to become the suffragettes so they were probably yep. spiritualists they were probably spiritualists as well uh, or a lot of them not all of them 
And there was a woman called Emma Harding Britton that I gave a talk about once, um, who came from London to New York and discovered spiritualism movement over there and became a well-known medium. And she went back to Scotland at that time or a bit later uh, in the century to start the spiritualist church movement from Scotland and wrote books and started the newsletters, um, spiritualist newsletters, etc., and then brought it down into England, even though, um, as I'll say, talk about later, um, mediumship was starting already before she came back to England, but she was a real instigator, a real dynamo to get it started in England on a big scale. Now, the other interesting thing you might find interesting, that it was at this time too, that a lot of the spiritualists were healers, right? Yes. So That's guess who they followed? Anton Mesmer. Mesmer, yes. So they believed in him absolutely and they learned healing through his methods of hypnotism, what yeah. we call now, but mesmerism in the day. So I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, Neptune rules hypnosis. Yep. And healing. Yep. And sleep. Oh, okay. Um, the interesting thing about it too. I found was that a lot of male mediums, males that became, I'm talking trance mediums, became mediums were considered uh, weak-minded mm. uh, or gay, mm. whatever fitted in those times. <laughs> um, and that was mainly because if they brought a female through, through them, like a young woman or a woman of any kind through them, they were considered to be weak-minded. But a woman could bring a man through and that was okay. Mm. So the men were really discriminated against being mediums. And but interesting enough, as the movement moved ahead and moved ahead, a lot of women who were mediums were threatened with um, institutions and to be certified as insane by doctors. Yes, that's when they started to have the sanatoriums for the mentally ill, didn't yes, they? So if, you, if you heard voices or you went into trance mm -hmm. or you took even a big interest in it, you were certifiable by the doctors or your husband, mm -hmm. whoever was in charge of you at that time. So um, I found all that very interesting. The other interesting thing I want to talk about in America is in the 1870s, you were talking about photography. Well, that's when spirit photography came in. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so it was actually Mary... Um, it's gone from my head. The present Mary Lincoln, who went for a sitting uh, with a guy called, if anyone wants to look him up, William Mumbler. Um, he in Washington, he was a photographer and uh, they sat her down and took a photo and there was Abe Lincoln photographer in spirit world with his hands on her shoulders. And I'll put that picture up wow. and so people can have a look, but it's just amazing. And um, so here it is now. Wow. And um, as you can see, it's just an amazing um, picture. So you can see him quite clearly behind there. So that started the movement of taking spirit photographs as well. Yeah. So it all sort of blends in with what you were saying. Yeah, people were um, claiming to see lots of spiritual things, weren't they, at that time? They were seeing things, feeling things from the other world. The well, the, also with the art, there were the um, uh, Bang sisters, Catherine and Elizabeth, they started to do art in precipitated art, which is you get a blank canvas, like, you know, a blank canvas, and you put it a certain way and they would sit with the client in their salon and spirit would draw art, portraiture, without them even touching it. And, and they were considered to be frauds there for a while, as they all were um, for a while. Um, but uh, they were found to be very genuine. So they had an amazing gift to do this. And I have never seen that again since or heard about it since they passed away and that was in Chicago. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so the other interesting thing was in the southern states of America they didn't start this, they didn't embrace spiritualism 
No. Right? So what they did, they but they incorporated the mediums into their religion mm -hmm. and got spirit me mes messages at their revivalist me meetings and all this sort of stuff rather than have a separate, mm -hmm. me you know, a separate mm -hmm. religion. Well, we got the Pentecostal churches speaking in tongues. Correct. So I think that's where it started. But so they found that really interesting. Now, in the early 1900s, that was the rise of the fake medium. So then you had, I guess, Neptune would also bring in um, Illusion. magic, illusions. Magic. Mm. And that's when Harry Houdini walked in on the scene as well, yeah. you know, to prove um, everyone was fake, which wasn't true, but uh, he went out to a lot of degree to prove that. He was wrong on a lot of occasions. But that was really interesting. Um, they also set up the first camp, spiritualist camps, um, in 1848. 1848? No way. Two yep. years after. Yep. Spiritualist camps. What was so that? Was so that was, at, that was in um, Maine. And then Lilydale was set up in 79. And then they had Camp Chesterfield in 1991. They also set up a school around 1900 which is still going today and it's called the Morris, oh, I can't read my writing, the Morris Pratt, the Morris Pratt Institute. And that's in Win Win Constance, um, and that's still going today. Um, and they started that to teach education in spiritualism, science, as well as reading, writing and arithmetic in those days. So um, they wanted to incorporate the new sciences as well. Which brings me to Emanuel Swedenberg. Of course, he was there too in the 18th century, 1800s. I guess the Amish, I didn't look them up. They started around that, that area in that time as well. Yeah, they would have. The Amish were very pure in their interpretation. And, and I know that in Lilydale, uh, which was the spiritualist community, if no one's ever read about it. Um, I know that the Mormons had the beginning of their um, spiritual experience just down the road from Lilydale. Yeah. And when Joseph Smith, he had a visitation of angels and personages of Christ, and that was a very new thing. Yes. Prior to that, no one ever claimed to see anybody. And he was the oh, first except person. In the Bible. Except yeah. in the Bible. First but, person to say, I've seen these, you know, spiritual entities and uh, just down the road from where it was all going on in Lilydale. And there's a special energy around there that causes people to have visions and all that in the in the day, which is why it was picked. Yeah. So that would that would be really that's that'd be spot on. And it's so fascinating that he had those visions and then he started the church. Well, they didn't believe him, of course, no. because it was so bizarre. And he was a child. He was 14, yes. I think. Yeah. And the other thing I wanted to say that it was in the 1850s that a visiting USA medium went uh, to England and started the interest in mediumship and psychic uh, developments over there. But as I said, it was Emma Harding who actually started the whole movement of the church situation. And in the 1850s, Queen Victoria and Albert were attending or had a medium who was a young boy of only 14 mm. come to the palace to give them seances then in the 1850s. No way. Mm. She was so pious too. Well, the public didn't know about it, did they? And also, the one thing I, I picked this guy because I thought you might find of interest is Chiro, um, who was the palmist. So he started his journey um, from Ireland um, and then England and then to India. He, he stole uh, on a boat to India and got trained by a Brahmin into palmistry and for two years and into astrology. And then he came back, and that was about the 1870s, 1880s. He came back and became world famous, as we know. So um, I thought you might find that of interest. Well, actually, speaking of India, two of the big gurus 
became of India became very popular and came to the West at that time. Oh. That was the first time the West, had ever, particularly America, had ever seen Indian gurus. Wow, it's amazing how it just happened with that sighting of that um, discovery of that planet. Yeah. And, and were, did they know, did, well, there were lots of astrologers back then. Did they know this was going to happen? No. It's not like they thought, well, we've discovered Neptune, so all these things are going to happen. We never know the introduction of a planet. It, it doesn't come with instructions. We only know in retrospect, you know, 100 years later, what's going on. So they didn't know this was going to happen. A big spiritual explosion. Mm. Such an incredible era, really. It's, I and mean, really painting, like, photography, you know, science, uh, women's uh, liberation really started then. Drugs. Uh, Imagine drugs. if we have painkillers where we'd be in medicine. We wouldn't do any operations. Freedom to love who you want. Mm. You know, it's just amazing. It's such a revolutionary uh, time, wasn't it? I mean, why are we still watching Pride and Prejudice on Netflix? It's still, I mean, I love it, but it was so poignant at the time because it was challenging all that status quo of, of yeah. love. And it was rewriting romance with that very novel, you know. And, and, of course, women got published as well for the first time. First time. It's, women are it's, very good at romance. Yeah, yeah. It's, but it was amazing, wasn't it, really? Amazing. And, and I guess um, that would have also been um, creativity would have been huge oh, at that huge. time. Huge. Art had an, a huge explosion. Huge. We, we stopped doing realism yes. at that time. And we started to paint in a fantasy world. Yes with feelings and um yeah you know, and you're entitled to have feelings in art all yeah of a sudden. yeah you could be somebody fascinating era wow mm -hmm. well i'm off for another cup of tea and uh i love your spooky background and mine's about as spooky as i could come up with with a few <laughs> it's chandeliers beautiful. it's lovely <laughs> all right jennifer okay see you mate see you Bye. later